This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles right now for a limited time. You guys can get 25% off the cost of a subscription. More on them in a bit. The sinking of the Titanic is one of the best-known maritime disasters of all time. The size of the ship, the massive death toll, and the blockbuster movie that won 11 Oscars have kept it in the public consciousness since it sank over a century ago. We know that more than 1,500 people lost their lives when the ship went down, but what else do we know about what the Titanic took with her to the bottom of the Atlantic? The Titanic left Southampton, England on the 10th of April 1912. It was an ocean liner built to be among the largest, most luxurious ships of the day. For its maiden voyage, it was headed to New York with over 2,200 passengers and crew on board, but this was actually far less than it could carry. There had been a coal strike at the time, which led to travel disruptions and uncertainty, so many people decided to wait until it was over before booking passage. As well as over 700 third-class passengers, or what me might term normal people, there were some fabulously rich people on board the Titanic. Among them was the owner of Macy's department store, Isidore Strauss, socialite Margaret Brown, who survived and was later known as the unsinkable Molly Brown, and one of the world's richest people, multi-millionaire John Jacob Astor IV. Considering that they were in the middle of the ocean, had woefully limited space in lifeboats, and a matter of only three hours from hitting the iceberg to sinking, it's not surprising that nobody was really bothered about taking much with them. But with all those wealthy people on board, there had to be some pretty nice Nice stuff in the hold of the ship. So, what interesting objects from the time were lost to the bottom of the sea? And forget the heart of the ocean, that wasn't real. Sorry. The Rubaiyat was a collection of Persian poems from 11th century poet, polymath, and all round smart person Omar Khayyam. Edward Fitzgerald translated the works, and it was first published in English in 1859. As you might expect from a translation of centuries-old Persian poems, the book did not initially fly off the shelves. The pre-Raphaelite set thought it was cool, though, and by the 1880s, the book had really taken off throughout the English-speaking world. That's why in 1911, a magnificent gold and jewel-encrusted version was made by specialist bookbinders Sangorsky and Sutcliffe. It took over two years and more than a thousand precious gems, including emeralds and rubies, to create. Hundreds of sheets of 22 karat gold were used. The leather covered book had a slipcase made from oak and was expected to fetch serious money at the rare books auction at Sotheby's. It seems that people weren't really in a spending mood, though, maybe due to the aforementioned coal strike, and the book was sold to American Gabriel Weiss for £450, a fraction of its expected price and less than half of its reserve price. So this bargain was packed up and sent on its way to its new home in America on board the Titanic. Obviously, we all know what happened next, and the exquisitely covered book made its home instead on the ocean floor. You might think that that would spell the end for the book, but many paper products have been recovered from the wreck, usually when they were found in bags or cases or other protective boxes. Traces of the Rubaiyat have never been found, but if it was well packaged, which presumably it was, and survived the sinking in one piece, it may be possible that at least some of it would have been preserved to this day. Leather fares well in submerged conditions, and the jewels would also likely still be there, so maybe in the future this treasure could still be uncovered. If it is, its value not only as a hugely precious item, but also as a historic artifact would be enormous. Although smoking opium had been outlawed in the US, there were more than four cases of opium noted on the Titanic cargo manifest. The manifest makes an interesting read with some of the other items, including 35 bags of rough wood, 12 cases of ostrich feathers, and 76 cases of dragon's blood. No further context is given there. It has been presumed that the opium belonged to the aforementioned mega-rich John Jacob Astor IV, as his family fortune had come from real estate, fur, and, yes, trading opium. His great-grandfather had made millions smuggling opium into China in the mid-19th century, so maybe the apple wasn't falling far from the tree. An importation ban to the US had been put in place in 1909, so it's not really clear why there were four cases in the Titanic's hold. Opium was still used for medicinal purposes, so it might have been making its way to pharmacies across the US, but then again, maybe Astor was just planning a really big party when he got back in the States. Either way, those cases of sweet, sweet narcotics made their way to the seafloor to be released 
released into the waters surrounding the wreck and maybe turning it into the fish's new favorite hangout spot. After initially not being worried about the boat sinking and then later helping his pregnant wife into what turned out to be the last lifeboat, Astor was seen smoking on the deck half an hour before the boat went down. His body was recovered on April 22, 1912. Now, more on the Titanic treasures in just a moment, but first, let me thank our wonderful sponsor, Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and non fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. Think of it as the Netflix for nerds, the Hulu for history buffs. Curiosity Stream is available on many platforms and web apps, including Roku, Android, Xbox One, Smart TVs, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, Amazon Kindle, and Apple TV. Look, if you've got a device with a screen that was made in the last few years, you're probably going to be able to watch Curiosity Stream on it. It's also offered worldwide, and it's constantly updated with awesome, timely content. Now, if you're enjoying today's video and are looking for more Titanic content, why not go over to Curiosity Stream, where you can catch their documentary, The Titanic's Tragic Twin, which is all about the RMS Britannic, which suffered a strangely similar fate. There's also 100 events that made the 20th century, and you could probably guess that the Titanic makes an appearance on that one. So, go to curiositystream.com forward slash side projects for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series. And right now, you can use the promo code SIDEPROJECTS to save 25% off the cost of an annual subscription, which comes out to only $14.99 a year, which is incredibly good value. Click the link below, go check it out, and let's get back to today's video. Only one car was recorded on the Titanic's cargo manifest, listed as One Case Auto, with the owner listed as Carter W.E. This was William Ernest Carter, son of a mining magnate who traveled in very exclusive circles, counting the Astors and Vanderbilts among his friends. The Carters had traveled to England in 1911 to attend the coronation of King George V and his wife, Queen Mary. After spending time doing whatever it is that rich people do, the Carter family, consisting of William, his wife Lucille, and their two children, booked cabins on the Titanic to return to the States. Carter had his brand new 1912 25 horsepower Renault CB Coupe de Ville stored in the Titanic's forward hold. And I'll stop you there. Yes, we say coupe in the UK. In the words of Jeremy Clarkson, a coupe is where you keep chickens. It's registered as being in a case, but whether that means the whole automobile was in a crate or that it was just not yet fully assembled isn't clear, considering that Renault had only been founded 13 years previously and that personal vehicles were still a huge luxury item, this must have cost Carter a very pretty penny. The whole family did survive the sinking, with Carter putting in an insurance claim for the car at $5,000, roughly $135,000 in today's money adjusted for inflation. In 2008, a similar model sold at auction for $269,500. $500. So, if this one ever makes a reappearance from the deep, it would fetch many, many times that. The forward hold is still mostly intact, but if the Renault ever is recovered, don't expect to be able to take it for a spin anytime soon. An interesting side note to this story is that while Carter originally said he had helped his wife and children into a lifeboat before trying to locate other women to help, his wife Lucille refuted this in later years by saying that he had woken her up when the ship hit the iceberg, but she didn't see him again. While she and another woman had to row the heavy lifeboats away from the sinking ship themselves, she'd found her husband already on board the rescue ship RMS Carpathia. Lucille Carter made a statement when filing for divorce from Carter in 1914, stating, I never saw him again until I arrived at the Carpathia at 8 o'clock the next morning when I saw him leaning on the rail. All he said was that he had had a jolly good breakfast and that he never thought I would make it. Charming. The most expensive item on board the ship, at least according to insurance claims filed in the wake of the Titanic disaster, was a painting by French artist Marie-Joseph Blondel. The painting, originally titled Un Bagnus, or A Bather, was a life-size oil painting of a naked lady stepping down into a sort of stylized bath that you might expect to see in Roman times. And no, she doesn't look like Kate Winslet. Blondel was very successful in his time, with this early painting being displayed at the Louvre in 1814, the year it was painted. Almost a century later, Swedish rich kid and umlaut heavy Moritz Haken Bjornström Stefansson snapped up Le Circassien en Bain to take it with him on his study trip to America, maybe wanting to flex on all those other students with Chat Noir posters on their walls. Sensibly deciding not to rush back for the large artwork when the ship started going down, Bjornström Stefansson actually only managed 
managed to survive the sinking by leaping into a lifeboat as it was being lowered into the sea. Afterwards, he made the largest single insurance claim against the White Star Line, the shipping company that owned the Titanic, for $100,000 or over $2.5 million today. Okay, so this artifact had a somewhat happier ending. One of the enduring images of the scenes after the ship hit the iceberg is that of the Titanic's band playing even as the inevitable was happening. Consisting of eight members, they started off in the first class lounge and then later moved to the front half of the ship, playing tunes to calm down the passengers and give them hope. Sadly, they all went down with the ship, with band's leader and violinist Wallace Hartley's last words reportedly being, Gentlemen, I bid you farewell. Hartley's body was recovered ten days later, along with his violin, which had been mostly protected in its leather case. He was listed as body number 224. Word had spread of the band's heroic selflessness, and his funeral had over a thousand attendees, with apparently tens of thousands more lining the procession route. In 2008, he received perhaps the greatest honor anyone could hope to achieve, with a Weatherspoons pub being named after him in his native Colon in Lancashire. In 2006, a violin was unearthed that was claimed to be the lost instrument from the Titanic. It was in a monogrammed case and had an engraved plate stating that it was a gift from Hartley's fiance. After seven years of careful research, which consisted of scans and expert analysis, evidence was also found that Hartley's fiance had managed to come into possession of the violin after the Titanic sank and it was declared as the genuine article. It was sold at auction for £900,000, that's $1.7 million, in 2013, making it the most expensive artifact from the Titanic so far. It's currently housed in the Titanic Museum attraction in Tennessee. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.